Hi everyone, let's get started. Um, since we are kind of behind schedule, I'm ZX. I'm working on Filecoin Economics uh, protocol apps. And but today I'm talking to you about some of the thesis research that I've done with uh, Michael and um, the Warren Center of Network and Data Sciences at UPenn. It's called Engineering Token Economy with System Modeling. So in today's talk, I hope to present to you a model and a simulation of a generalized token economy so that we can apply some of this concept that we talked about earlier today in a, in a more concrete sense. All right, let's get started. So to start off, what is a token economy? I think we, we I think in some of the talks yesterday, we talked a lot about what exactly, what is a token economy. Basically on the highest level, it's an economy that pays out token for any provider that provides goods and services for the network. In a new Cypher's case, that would be key, um, key management system. In Live Pierce's case, that would be um, video encoding. In Filecoin's case, that could be file storage. In Ethereum, that would be computation. In Bitcoin, that could be security. So any of this economy, as long as um, there's a provider providing some goods and services, and, they get, and then they can get paid in cryptocurrency or token, we call that a token economy. And the next question to ask is, why do we need to do system modeling for these um, token economies? I think the short answer is crypto economics is hard um, because you need to understand all the different moving parts in your protocol from cryptography to distributed systems. You need to talk to the product team to, and, the bit, and biz dev team to know what is the goal that the system is trying to achieve. And as mentioned earlier in the talks today by Michael and Sherman and Chris, like it's all complex systems at, at the core. So like some of this patchy like solution that people are trying to do today uh, in the past could lead to really bad system failures. That's why it's really helpful for us to model the system as a whole and see how the system can evolve and how the goals can be achieved and what are the constraints of the system. And lastly, I think sometimes some of the recommendation from economic uh, from re some of the recommendation or decision from an economic standpoint are hard to visualize what exactly is impact on the system. So having a model on the whole system itself will allow us to articulate that impact um, and justify the de decision much easily, much more easily. So here's a generalized framework. Um, I think it shows up in some of this slide, this diagram shows up in some of the past presentation today. So basically we draw inspiration from some of the differential game literature in the past that irrespective of the agent behave, specific behavior, we still want the system level goals to be achieved. So basically, um, as protocol designers, we design like policies and mechanism of the protocol. And then for agent in the system, they basically respond, given some external noise, it could be the market activity, it could be anything, and then it will look at the system global state and then derive a private belief about their signal. What do they believe? What is the profitability right now? What do they believe about um, how the system is going to evolve. And then they can, and then given the allowable policy space that we define as protocol designers, agent will make a decision about um, given all these states. And from there, um, given all these actions, we'll be able to generate state updates through the mechanism steps, and that will give us um, the, next, um, the next state of the system. And from here, we want to propose or want to come up with a simple model or a simulation such that we can uh, such that we can we can have a very baseline economy about a baseline economy of this a baseline token economy and then we can run experiments um, experiment on this economy and see how our decision on a protocol standpoint would affect uh, macroeconomic behaviors. So to do that, we need to make, first make like two simplifying assumptions such that we are not really bogged down by these details and then we can look at the system economy as a whole. The, the first simplifying assumption that we are making here is uh, we are assuming that every miner or user, they are identical to each other. We call it unit miner or unit um, user. And each of them consume or produce like one unit of service. I think in um, Yongdong's talk yesterday, he talks about how do you define a unit in Live Pierce case. Um, similarly, I think uh, in, in, for the sake of our model, we just treat that that unit has been defined, and then there will be different unit miners and unit um, users providing that service or consuming that service on the network. And a large miner in real life would be an aggregate of many small, uh, many unit miners in the model. The second assumption is uh, we assume that it's it's. Um, because for a simple model, we just assume like a perfectly competitive market, so that we don't have to worry about like 
a lot of the dynamics within the price. We just assume that price would be a very effective signal about the supply and demand. When there is supply meet demand, there's always a transaction um, that's happening. And from here, we now we want to define this system both in terms of its system state and also like the system dynamics. Because how what the system state is, uh, states are, and how the how the system can evolve, it basically encapsulates the entire um, token economy. So even for a very simple, like bare bone simple token economy, we can easily have more than ten states. So here's how this works. Um, this is a token economy of supply and demand of goods and services. So you have the supply of the goods at every, at every particular time around t which could be any time set that you define. It could be as granular as like at every block, every day, every week, right? And every, so every, at every time set T, there is some supply and demand coming to the network. So there will be like the delta S and delta D at, at time T. And then there will be some departure of like the supply and demand. And then at the end of the time, time step T, there will be some supply and demand, it's on the network. And given the, perfect, uh, the perfectly competitive market assumption, we assume that some quantity will be transacted at the time step, and then there will be some market price, which will be Q and P. And then there's also a token price, which is, um, which is K. And K is a function of like, uh, it's, a function, it's a combination of the intrinsic value of the token plus some speculative value of the token. Um, right now, like, I think we don't really have a very good definition for most of the token today. We don't have a good definition of what the intrinsic value is. But in some of the past research that's done by Claudio, people defined that as what is the um, fiat amount of resources that you need to spend to earn one unit of the token? Um, so in some of the past research, like people define that as the intrinsic value of the token. So we can use that for the model here. There will be one, uh, the inverse of V over t, uh, VT, and UT will be the speculative value. And then we also define like some kind of abstract index of how far the network is progressing along its goals, which is I of T. Um, so this, this can be useful in, in terms of your own engineering block rewards such that it targets um, this, this particular KPI the network is trying to optimize for. In most of the cryptocurrency network that we see today, people use an open loop block reward schedule, like in Bitcoin, right? Like the block reward has nothing, um, there's, in that context, basically that KPI is basically time step. So basically what that means is um, the block reward follows a fixed schedule before, regardless of what happens on the network. So in Bitcoin's case, there will be like the six year half life that we were talking about. Um, and from there, we define like the state dynamics, the system dynamics. So at every time step, the following things would happen. So some unit service, uh, unit service supply and demand arrive at the network. And, um, and, that would, and that is basically driven by the private signals of all the different agents in the system. And then some transaction will happen for the services um, given the unit service is supply and demand. And then block rewards are minted and miner makes a profit from the system. Oh, but, and that is RT. So basically that's like how profitable is mining in the network, basically providing the service in the network. And then from there, some speculation might happen that will change the token price. And that will also change some of the private signals about profitability or how, like, or how, um, how cheap or how expensive is this service being provided on the network. And these are the more specific equation that we will use to drive um, the dynamics in the, this baseline simulation, simulation or model. Uh, we, and some of these stoch uh, stochastic processes, they are just examples of distribution that we can use to drive those um, signals. It doesn't have to be this specific distribution. You can always customize that depending on, your, depending on the specific token economy that we're talking about. So the, um, supply, the variable supply and demand, we've used a traditional like Poisson distribution process. Um, the mean of that distribution would get greater if mining is very profitable in terms of supply. More supply will arrive to the network when mining is very profitable, which makes sense. That is in the lambda S equation. And um, more demand will come to the network if the goods or services provided on this network is really cheap. If the price is going down, more people will come and we assume that this, there's a demand for these goods and services on the network. More people will come to consume that goods or services. And from there, we can figure out the supply and demand. And then given that the price can be determined and the quantity as well, um, and the block reward, we, let's say we, we, we assume the block reward targets this goal the network is trying to optimize for. And in the most cases, in open loop setting, that would be just delta T. So it follows like a predetermined timetable of how block reward is going to be injected into the system. 
And then k of t, which is the price of the token, which is would just be a combination of the intrinsic value of the token and the speculative value. And the speculative value could be, we can put in an agent policy that is um, agent we're trying to estimate what is the, um, the immediate reduction in supply of the token. If there's an immediate reduction in supply, people will try to speculate and that will drive up the speculative value of the token. Or people need some kind of hook to basically speculate and drive up the value. And then we define a cost. Cost will go into like how profitable it is for a miner or provider to provide that service to the network. And then now we can, now, okay, so given the definition of the system in terms of system state and dynamics, now we can basically run a very simple experiment to show the power of this, um, um, this, simulation, uh, this simulation. So we basically, we do a control experiment of, um, we're basically just changing one function, which is how the block reward is being distributed into the system. One, the one case would be a simple step decay function like that in, in the case of Bitcoin. Six year half-life, a uh, four year, uh, four year half-life, a simple halving period. And then the other, the other block reward schedule could just be a simple exponential decay with the same half-life. We would think that, oh yeah, like, um, like a step decay will introduce arbitrary shock into the system. We would think that that's a bad idea from a system standpoint. And an exponential decay will be smoother. Um, there will be a nicer system properties. And then we can run experiment to see, just given this very simple change, what is the emergent property that we can observe from the simulation? And as it turns out, uh, with the step decay, which is on the left, and this is um, at the smooth exponential decay on the right, with the step decay, agent we try to speculate around that discrete um, halving period, and that inject energy into the system, and some of the energy get retained in terms of the token price. And as we can see, there's at least an order of magnitude difference um, in the terminal token price of the um, price of the token. And another 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 interesting thing that we observe is. This is basically Q. Q is the quantity transacted on the system every time step T. So this is the growth of Q over time. And on the left is basically the step decay function. On the right is the smooth exponential decay. We ran like 100 experiment Monte Carlo simulation on, um, on this two different system. We observe a general rightward uh, shift in terms of the aggregated growth in Q. What that means is given these shocks, like we actually can observe like greater quantity transacted on the network. Which is, which is, and these two, these two diagrams are actually like internally coherent because, like, when the price becomes, when the token price becomes greater, mining becomes more profitable. So more miner will come to the network to provide, to provide like the goods and services, which drive down the price of the goods and services, and that results in more consumption. So this goes to show that a very simple change in the protocol will have very big impact on the, on the macro and the global level. And to sum up, I think like here, over here we present a framework to bridge token economies with stochastic dynamical systems. So now you can basically have a model of your, of your economy and you can, you can reason about how the different pieces in your protocol uh, will evolve and what kind of change and all the changes that you introduce into your system, how would that impact the overall economy? And we also have a baseline simulation based on open loop block reward schedule to illustrate this power. As we observed earlier, we only make one change, which is the block reward function, and everything else holds constant. We observe total, very different behavior in the economy, and it's and and which is the second point, right? Like the agent level incentive uh, would drastically change the global emergent behavior, and there are many other interesting research direction that we can take from here, right? For instance, we we make a lot of simplifying assumptions earlier about speculation. We also assume like everything is the same. You can throw in different subpopulation of agents have different behaviors, and you can also customize of how the dynamics will actually, like for for instance, like the um, we we use a very simple Poisson distribution for the arrival of supply and demand. That distribution can also be changed. So like there are many interesting work given this generalized framework, and in so far as reasoning through about all of the token economics and all of what exactly what impact do you have? I think this. Uh, generalized framework provide a very good starting point and basis. Yeah, and I think that's all for my presentation. And any questions? Well, thank you. Yeah. Yes. I saw the simulation results, but I didn't really see any comparisons with existing token economies. Yeah, so this is like a generalized version of a token economy. So there's no like a specific comparison. Yeah. And there's a 
outside outstanding roadmap item for mapping this onto live pair and a few other things, but it's part of the idea of coming out with the collaborations, looking for um, basically teams to work on projects. So yeah. It, it, literally, the roadmap is start to map things down onto specific instances and figure out the back end. And we can just customize a lot of these like blocks in the uh, in the dynamics of the system. Just uh, go for it. How data driven were these distributions? Like, were, were they just like distributions that you randomly like thought of and put up uh, based on your understanding of the system, or were they collected from, from actual? Yeah. So for this model, I think like we we I, we derived the distribution from like first principle reasoning and some of the past research uh, literature on what people usually do for a similar situation. But definitely this can be, you can throw in like another model here to model that distribution. Yeah. In, in applied settings, you really draw stochastic process models that are fit from real data that's in an analogous system or several analogous systems. Um, yeah. But this was from a master's thesis and from a journal paper where the assumptions match the literature as opposed to yeah. being driven by a, um, like, like a project Say that again? Yes, it was implemented in CatCat, and I believe you can put in different kind of distribution in the, uh, in the system. Yeah. I think it depends on the scale. I think like what the scale, where, the, where exactly the scale that we're looking at. I think if it's um, very agent based up to a specific agent, like we may be able to use like the languages um, as defined in a smart contract. But I think over here, we want to reason about how the system evolved, what is the goal, and what is the fundamental force and structure. Like we don't really need to go to down to that level. But I, I believe like maybe Tarun's group have done some work in like um, porting over like smart contract languages into like agent based modeling. Yeah.